I'm Rebecca, and we are Mama Bear Apologetics. Apologetics. We're just two gals talking about life's big questions from a biblical worldview. Because when it comes to the battle of ideas, we need to be able to say, mess with my kids and I will demolish your arguments. You mess, I demolish. Got it? Capiche? <laughs> <laughs> Rise up, ladies. Rise up, Mama Bears. This might not affect your faith, but it might affect your children's. Hey, we got Hillary and Rebecca, and we are continuing in our series right now discussing both the debate and the apologetics conference that we went to this last weekend. And one of the things that I really want to address, because it came up not only at the debate, but also at the conference, is the idea of, can we trust the New Testament eyewitnesses? Can I just read a quote I just read? (laughs) Yes. This is from uh, Dr. Dan Wallace's website, and it's a blog post he wrote looking at a book by another New Testament scholar called Craig Blomberg. And Craig Blomberg is really dealing with a lot of what Bart Ehrman has written in his books, in particular one of Bart Ehrman's books, Misquoting Jesus. And as we said in our previous podcast, Bart Ehrman is a New Testament critic, and a lot of professors like to use his stuff because he just sits there, and most of his books just discredit the New Testament documents that we have. Dan Wallace writes here, he says, In recent years, it has been estimated that over 60% of kids coming from Christian homes abandon the faith by the time they get done with college. It is time for pastors and other Christian leaders to educate the masses about the reality of the transmission of the Bible. Mm. If we don't, the fallout will only get worse. Mm, that's a good quote. Yeah. So just the, and Dr. Wallace spoke at this conference that we went to on the, on the New Testament and whether or not we can trust it. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things we've discussed in one of the, the previous podcasts is just if you let kids discover that the, I don't want to call them errors because they're not errors. I mean, it's it's variance, mm-hmm. but differences don't equal contradiction. Uh, but to a skeptic, it does. And to a skeptic, Because it does. they have this, well, they're looking for it, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. I really think. But they have this criteria of you know, credibility that's just discounts all ancient Basically documents. almost all of history. All of history. So it's like <laughs> stacks up to history because none of it's reliable. Yeah, none of it's reliable. Yeah, yeah. which Bart Ehrman was actually saying. But um, yeah. if you let your kids discover this on their own, they're going to start asking what else has been hidden from me. Right. And uh, we were actually talking to a guy at the conference who created like a really great program for kids exploring some of these topics. And he presented to, I won't say which publisher but shame on them who yes. said yeah who said no we're not going to publish that because we don't think it's a good idea to introduce these questions to kids and we're like are you kidding me they're gonna these questions kids are might already even be asking these questions yeah yeah and so it's like ask i mean that's the whole ostrich head in the sand of well if we don't if we don't look at it it doesn't exist no yeah it does this is exactly it's not only when they should be asking these questions, but this is where they should be asking these questions. They should be, because these kids aren't going to go out and get these books on their own. If it's done as a children's book, you likely have the parents reading it to them. This is exactly the person that you want yeah. to be addressing these things. So anyway, current research that is, has come up is something called flashbulb memory. A flashbulb memory is when you have something that is extremely emotional, something like when JFK was shot. For our generation, it would be... 9-11. 9-11. It mm-hmm. would be, what were you doing, you know, when you heard about 9-11, that everybody has a story. Mm-hmm. And so a flashbulb memory is when you have some really intense emotion that takes a memory and just puts it into, I mean, it's just like, I remember that moment. I remember what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And there have been a lot, of, a lot of research showing that these flashbulb memories are not quite as accurate as you would think they would be. I am expecting Bart Ehrman to come out with a book on this soon because he says that he's been doing all sorts of research yes. on flashbulb memory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure he's only looking at the skeptical stuff and not the other stuff. That Yeah, he's, he's very good at cherry picking. Yes. The Challenger explosion is probably the most recent, not, I don't want to say most recent one, but it's the one that's been talked about the most, where they interviewed kids, I think it was at Emory University, mm-hmm. uh, right after the Challenger explosion to get um, ask a bunch of questions about what happened, you know, who were you with, what were you doing, what were you thinking, what were you feeling, and then I can't remember how much longer, was it 30 years later? No, I think they, they, they first they um, interviewed them two hours afterwards, and then several years later. Okay. Yeah. I and can't remember maybe how there's, Maybe there were more than two time points. Because so. I've got to imagine... 
I mean, that wasn't even 30 years ago, was it? No. Okay. No, it was um, six, so almost. Yeah, years, I guess yeah. almost 30 years ago. Yeah, and so, and then looking at their memory later, as opposed to their memory right after, to see um, how much the stories matched up. And what's being reported at is that memories drastically decrease and they're not accurate at all. When we start looking to this further, this is literally, literally a glass half full, glass half empty kind okay. of question. And it's not really even giving you all the data points. It's not giving you all the data points. And I say it's like the literal glass half empty, half full is because half of the memories that were recorded, 50%, 50 were accurate, accurate and 50% were not. And none of them um, reported that the Challenger did not blow up. <laughs> yeah. They all knew that it blew up. Yeah. So the big, the key event, which in the case of the New Testament would be Christ's crucifixion, Christ's resurrection. <laughs> They didn't get those things wrong. Yeah, they yeah. didn't get those wrong, which is... The, okay, so there's a lot of ways... This is something that your kids very likely, I mean, probably sometime in high school will start bringing up. How can we know that these eyewitness testimonies are accurate? Because mm -hmm. we look at all the research, and, you know, it says that we can't trust eyewitness testimonies. So let's, let's look at the research and see what we can say about eyewitness testimony. First off, I would want to look at the exper uh, experimental method mm -hmm. from this, because first off... I'm already going to say bias yeah. is going on because if you have a 50-50 and they're only reporting the ones that have a discrepancy, that right there is a big red flag to right. me. Right, that the researchers had a goal and they yeah. were not, they were had more, what, what would we call it, confirmation bias. Yeah, yeah confirmation they, yeah. bias. Yeah. And, and so one of the, you know, there's a very possible way that they could have gotten some of these answers. So I'm going to pretend that someone had given me a quiz right after the 9-11 I probably would have answered a bunch of questions. If they'd asked me, you know, a year later, if they gave me all the same questions, I might not know, you know, I might not remember what I was wearing. Mm -hmm. But if I went up to them and said, well, I don't remember, and they say, well, just do the best you can, you know, you have to put something there. So put something, and I just had to guess. Now they can look at that question and be like, oh, look, she doesn't have that memory. I never claimed that I remembered right. what I was wearing because that kind of stuff to me is really stupid because if you have something huge that's happening in front of you, mm -hmm. The, I think your your vision kind of narrows, and all the peripheral stuff probably starts to go away. That I might not remember who I was with or who was standing around because I, my eyes are laser focused on this huge event that just happened. Right, right. And so you you relate that back to the New Testament, and we don't really have doctrines around what Mark was. Well, some people think Mark was the one that ran off naked. <laughs> <Jesus> <laughs> But that's the, only, that's the that. only clothing thing we get in the New Testament. You know, <laughs> They're not trying to remember those kind of level of details. They were remembering some of the level of details, sure, like how many people were there, who was talking, and, and such as that. Yeah, how <clears throat> is it a one-to-one -one correlation between the types of things the people in the Emory study were asking them to remember versus what we see recorded in the New Testament, that kind of memories there? You have to, you might be comparing apples and oranges in that sense. Yeah, and there was one particular thing that I know that you and I picked up on immediately was, okay, if, so if we're finding this 50-50 difference between people that remember and the people who don't, okay, now that tells me that there's something else that's going into this that's causing people to remember accurately versus causing them to not remember accurately. Yes. Mm -hmm. And like you you mentioned, you were so funny sitting next to you in the debate and you looked over <laughs> all your table. Why didn't they ask people who had a parent on the Challenger? Yeah. That I bet you someone whose parent was on the Challenger might remember that a little bit. Or an more. astronaut. Yeah, yeah, or another astronaut, mm -hmm. exactly. Or, or the people that were sitting in the control room you know, there in Houston when the thing blew up. I mean, depending on how close you were to the events and how really emotionally invested you were in it as far as, like, personally, yeah. um, that's going to really affect your memory as well. Yeah, and so I actually looked that up to see if there were any studies done on that, and I actually did find one by two Danish researchers, Bernson and Thompson, both named Dorothy. I think that's cute, Dorothy and Dorothy. <laughs> Bernson and Thompson. Uh, and they actually studied memories related to the Danish occupation in 1940 and the liberation in 1945. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they found is that uh, people who had closer ties to the resistance remembered the events way more accurately. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so it shows that, like, how much investment do you have in this, because the, the people that were there for the Challenger explosion, they probably knew, oh, you know, people do stuff in space, but 
it's not something that impacts, and not even afterwards, it didn't impact their daily life. Even, even, you know, 9-11 is a great example for Americans, just how deeply it affected all of us. But I tell you that the people that had, that knew, um, that were in New York City, I will tell first of all, people in New York City, my friends that were there every year on Facebook, they share where they were, what happened, what they remember. Mm -hmm. And they, since they were in New York City, it was so much closer to them. People that knew people in, in the, the Twin Towers or on one of the planes. The wife that spoke on the cell phone with her husband as he took out the plane in Pennsylvania. People, the closer you were, the more vivid and accurate their memories. And I wonder if there's a study going on right now. There should be. I would, like to, I would like yeah. to see that. I would even like to go back to the Emory students and find out, like, okay, how much did this impact you? How many times do you think you talked about this? Because um, some of the research I was looking at was differentiating between a flashbulb memory, which mm -hmm. is really that personal experience of a memory. Mm -hmm. You know, how did I experience this circumstance? And, and comparing that to, I can't remember what they call it. It might have been an everyday memory or it might have just been a historical memory of what happened. Okay. So it's like, how did I experience this versus what happened? So if we're going to even look back, you know, kind of like you said, did the Challenger explode? People are probably going to remember which, you know, how the towers went down, which tower went first, because you have people talking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's the actual memory. Okay, what was I wearing when it happened? Who cares? Yeah. Or was it one teacher or two teachers that came in to tell you know, tell us when it happened. A lot of times people, I mean, that's not that big of a deal. We're going to remember what happened. More of the gist, more of the big story. Yeah. Yes, yes. And that's one reason why we might have some of the discrepancies in like the account of the women that find the tomb. I think we talked about this on the last podcast. Did they see one angel? Did they see two angels? Was it one demoniac? Was it two demoniacs? Um, when he, you know, had all, the one with the legion of demons, you know, it, it, there's slightly different tellings and that might just have to do with these are actual witness testimonies that they're using. They are not they are going and they're interviewing these people to compile these gospels. And and so it has the earmarks of people maybe not remembering the exact detail as far as minor detail like that, but they're remembering the major events that are staying the same. Yeah, and I, I think that is also another example where we could say glass half full, glass half empty. In this case, I'm going to say glass is half full in the sense of these gospel mm -hmm. writers Mm -hmm. weren't thinking, you know what, in 2,000 years they're going to find out this thing about flashbulb memories and the peripheral details are the things that are going to have more discrepancies. So let's let's make our peripheral details have some discrepancies <laughs> so it sounds more like... No, it actually lends authenticity. It lends authenticity. Yeah. So if you want to look at it glass half empty, you can say, well, you know, why they, they should have remembered it exactly. Obviously it's not inspired. No, I mean, I don't think you can say that. I would say more like this lends credibility that they're just trying to record things as they saw it because you got to know, like you mentioned before, people picked up on these differences a lot longer before now. It's been 2,000 years. We didn't yeah. just discover, oh my gosh. Well, and it's an amazing thing. A lot of people want to say, well, these are just copies of copies and copies of copies of copies. And co I think Bart Ehrman said that, right? Yes. Well, so yeah, there's a lot of copies. The church had a lot of opportunity to, to, to kind of fix these little discrepancies and did they no nope. they didn't because they wanted to be faithful in their transmission which says a lot actually it's amazing that human god must have been involved in that too because i just know human nature yeah and even the church with its corruption and you know the church is not perfect yeah because okay. they might say well you know let's maybe destroy the ones that don't have these discrepancies and mm -hmm. just keep the ones that you know all have the same story because we know for a fact that if we were to have scripture that had exactly the same thing with everybody, they'd be crying, you know, BS. Yeah, yeah. They, they would be like, well, these are too close <laughs> yeah. together. So it's like if, if the stories are exactly the same, they're going to say that's evidence against us. And if the stories are have slight discrepancies, that's also evidence against us. Yeah. It's a, you know, no-win situation. No-win, no-win, yeah. 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 So, but it's like, I, I, I consider it a, I consider it a win because I think that that, that shows that these were actual eyewitness testimonies that, you know, with their human fallibility as far as details, but mm -hmm. no one's confused over which towers went down or mm -hmm. how many towers there were, or maybe probably approximate time of the day. Actually, I'm not even sure if I remember the time of the day. Yeah. And one of the things too, that you need to remember that we all need to remember, even where the parallels between 9-11 and the resurrection, this whole thing, the, the gospel stories, this is where it breaks down too. Anybody that you ask about the events of 
whatever they say is not going to possibly have them killed. Yes. These New Testament writers were sticking to their stories, but not sticking to it just like a person would stick to their... I would stick to my story that I was sitting in my car at my UD Southwestern listening to NPR when I heard it. You know, that didn't... Telling someone I'm not going to lose my life. These people, when they told these, these stories about Jesus, they were basically kind of excommunicated from yeah. the Jewish community. Mm-hmm. Um, they were got the charge of blasphemy, which comes with a capital punishment because they were calling this man God. Um, they, all of these testimonies were given at great personal risk. What, I don't know what we could compare that with today. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how we would communicate that to kids because, I mean, some of the worst things can, can happen to a kid, you know, would be n- be not allowed to go to a birthday party. Yeah. So if you're telling me something's true, I'm trying to think of what we could have that kids would be so committed to that they would be willing to be punished even if they knew that they were right mm-hmm. um, in explaining. But I think that's one of the things that even if you were to put it in that language for kids, that's going to that's gonna be hitting home. For them, if say, okay, you're going to say that something or other happened at school, and people are going to start questioning you, and then I'm going to start saying, well, because you're saying this, um, you can't go to the birthday party. I, you know, would you be willing to do that for something that you made up? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, if they're not willing to do it, if they're not willing to miss the birthday party for something they made up, I guarantee they're not going to want to lose their life, lose their <laughs> life, or lose their family and be like, okay, well, if you hold to this story, mommy and daddy are going to be separated from you forever. You still want to hold to that yeah, story? Yeah, you're going to have to be, and, and you're going to be on the run for the rest of your life. Yeah. And yeah, like Paul was, you're going to be stoned. You're going to, back in those days, they were people through rocks with him. But don't worry, you'll survive the first stoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll just be in a lot of pain. So another... Another paper that I looked at, it's called Emotion, Memory, and Attention in the Taboo Stroop Paradigm. Ignore the last part. That's just the specific test that they did. It was kind of interesting. But one of the quotes that I like from it was they had reviewed a lot of the literature. Whenever you write uh, a peer-reviewed journal, most of your introduction has to revolve around what literature Mm -hmm. has said in the past and trying to back it up. So one of the statements they make is most of the naturalistic studies suggest that confidence in the ability to accurately remember emotionally charged events is remarkably high. And so it, it gave a uh, sort of reference was David and Gliske, 2002, which I'd have to go back and look to see what paper that was. Mm-hmm. And then they, in, in the next paragraph, they said, well, there's some other studies that contradict that. So again, you're going to have studies that are saying these emotionally charged things are, are high versus low. And you really need to go back and look at how the experiment was conducted. Yeah. And does it look like someone was trying to prove a point? Yeah. That, and and, and let's give them the benefit of the doubt. You have to um, say, well, okay, how does this compare with the specific events around the New Testament? And there are some things that make that whole situation very unique. One thing that I was remembering was that Christ, in a way was kind of protecting them from a traumatic, like like an absolute shock when he was finally arrested, even though they were still shocked and they ran off. They still weren't getting it, but he, how long had he been preparing them? How long had he been telling them he was going to go to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he was going to be put on trial, he was going to suffer, he was going to be crucified? He, he had been preparing them. So it, what, it, there was a shock, yes, but was it the same kind of shock that would happen if someone, you know, of 9-11? We had no preparation for that, yeah. right? No, no one was sending us messages that this was exact. You know, these exact things. Some planes were going to be blown into the building. I'm sure someone could read into Nostradamus, <laughs> <laughs> probably. But so you have to look at the actual experiments themselves and ask yourself, okay, how does this correlate this modern experiment too? I mean, you were doing there, there's a you're doing something in a, a modern setting that may, might have been a totally different cultural setting. Um, one thing that we talked about is a lot of these are looking at individual memories, these studies. Well, this is actually, these are, you can look at the New Testament as corporate memories because mm-hmm. these are something that the church was teaching from very early on. And we could talk about the the, um, the creedal statements like in Philippians, some of the things that Paul shares. Yeah. But these were things that from the get-go, the church was teaching and Paul was preaching and Peter was preaching and there was this corporate sort of transmission of the memory and there was an official, um, let's see how I, how I called it, um, there was an overseeing 
of the events and how the events are described and certainly the gist of the, the events. And this was sort of preserved in this community environment that is a, probably a, a, going to be a lot more accurate than just one person. Yeah, and I, I came up with kind of a silly analogy when we were at the conference of what does a corporate memory look like? And the picture that I got in my head was a bunch of uh, guys who have memorized football stats that are talking about <laughs> what they were doing with yeah. that touchdown. I don't know team. why I think that that that, <laughs> that, that Mike Dick guy. Do you remember that from the <laughs> SNL? Yeah. Okay, we had this podcast has just gone down. <laughs> Bring it, sorry, not live, but but yeah, the the Bears, the Bears, the Bears. Yeah, uh, yeah like going over, you know, the the touchdown in 1988 and who it was that tackled who, and these guys that will sit around and talk about this and kind they, of stuff, and they'll correct each other. They'll correct each yeah. other. Yeah. And so we got to imagine it's not like, you know, it's going to be quite the same thing, but you're going to have yeah, people. Yeah, because these memories are more important. People are dying for these memories. People don't die for football stats. Yeah, no, people <laughs> don't die for football stats, and if they do, that's ridiculous. And we, they have people that are correcting them. They have other people that were there. They have other people that were able to fill in the blanks of things that maybe they could remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And so you don't just have me, myself, and I sitting around with my, my thoughts, and then, you know, three years go by, and then I'm trying to recall it again like you do with... with the Emory and yeah. maybe some of these other things. Now, like you said in that one, the other one about the Danish resistance, they were part of resistance. They were part of a group of people. There was a cor probably some corporate memory going on. Mm -hmm. It was probably not even as accurate as what's happening here because they're they weren't they're not an oral culture like we are yes, today. Yes, that so. was actually something else I wanted to bring up is the idea of oral culture. And I actually was trying to find research on this, but I, I wasn't able to find. Let me see. I don't think I was able to find what I was looking for because they were all in book studies. They weren't, but um, they weren't just an article format. But I want to look at. Uh, there was another part, and I, I can't find it in my notes here about another study that was talking about kind of, um, they had a way of kind of recreating kind of a flashbulb memory type thing, but using different words, and it was uh, it was actually Spanish words. And so they would ask these people with interval amounts of time in between when they had learned it and how many times they had learned it uh, to remember, you know, what these words were, and they found that, you know, most of the forgetting happened within the first six years, and then after six years, between they, you know, tested them then and even up to 25 years later, their memory was the same. Okay. And so, like, that that's kind of a side thing that even if, whenever the, the accounts were written, if we're going to say, oh, they're going to remember a lot less this amount longer, as opposed to, you know, if it was done, you know, within six years, it'd be more reliable. And, you know, according to at least this study, you know, between six and 25, it kind of didn't make a difference. But the one thing that they did find that made a very significant difference was... Um, how much exposure the person had to these same words after that. If there was like some like little review, like they went back to the college campus mm -hmm. and they kind mm -hmm. of had a review that that significantly impacted their ability to remember it. Right, right. And so, so it's really about review and going over. Yeah. And you would expect the early church to be constantly doing that every because that's the core of their belief. Yeah. They were being, uh, again, I keep bringing this up, but it's so key. They were losing their lives for this. They were being persecuted for this. So, of course, they're going to be going over these events constantly. Yeah, and you really can't underemphasize, or, or you can't overemphasize that. I mean, enough. And, and, they were, and they were converting new people. Yeah. So they were sharing the events. So one of the things that we have to look at, this is one of the things that drove me absolutely bonkers at the debate, is that comparing, it's like even if we do all these studies now, they can show what they're going to show, but... Comparing that to an oral culture, you just can't do that because they are night and day difference. So mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, Bart kept bringing up that had me rolling my eyes every single time was saying, well, I can't remember what President Obama said at his speech last week. Okay, so we're going to compare that to a culture where they didn't have, you know, TiVo. They mm -hmm. didn't have YouTube. They mm -hmm. didn't have blogs after the, you know. They didn't have anything written. They didn't have anything Every time written. they were hearing something, they had been trained from an early age to remember in a way that we don't have to be trained anymore. We're, they're, they're probably huge parts of our brain that we don't use anymore that they used to use because from a very early age, that, that's all they had. Yeah. Well, I mean, I even compare it to me as a, as a high schooler. I think about the number of phone numbers I had in my head right. when I was in high school yeah. before, before, you know, it's like there were some cell phones out, but it wasn't very common. Mm -mm. 
and the number of phone numbers I have in my head now. Yeah. And ironically... That's a very good example. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. And I used to have a million I yeah. could remember. And, yeah. I can actually still remember some of them mm -hmm. from high school. And I can't tell you... I can't tell you my sister's home number now. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, it's in my cell phone. I don't have to remember. And that's the thing with an oral, oral culture versus our culture is you don't have to remember yeah. right now. And it, it's like, think back to uh, when you were in college... Everybody knows that you had the professors that would let you have the formulas, like for physics or calculus mm -hmm. or something. There were some professors that would let you have the formulas and some that wouldn't. Yes. Which one do you think you really knew the formula on? Right. The professor that wouldn't let you have a little cheat sheet of formulas. For all they knew, if I don't remember this, nobody's ever going to know. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm going to remember it. As they're listening, they probably have a lot better listening ability as they're listening because see I don't know how many times I've been listening and I think well I didn't hear that but I can go back and get the transcript later yes but or I can ask somebody they had to remember that everyone around them and then if there was something that they forgot they could probably fill it in with someone else yeah. so there was this idea of a community of mm -hmm. people that would remember certain parts and and be able to fill in you know, missing parts, so. Yeah, with as much advances as technology does for us, there is a part of people that's becoming dumber and dumber. Like, mm -hmm. pe people's ability to get from point A to point B, back when you had to, like, figure it out from the sun and, you know, the direction of the wind and, you know, the river that went by. Mm -hmm. You know what, they probably had, they have a lot better sense of direction. I mean, love my husband, but that, that man cannot get from... <laughs> He almost can't even follow the GPS instructions sometimes. Oh, don't, 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 don't mention that. Yeah. I'm the same way. <laughs> I'm like, okay, slight left turn. And then I'm sitting here trying to analyze, like, what exactly is a slight left turn? Is there a huge left turn? I mean, come on. <laughs> What's the difference? There's gradients of turns. Uh, yeah, but it's like, back, you know, back in the day, back when I was a kid, I remember thinking mm -hmm. that my, my dad just magically knew how to get places, but... You used a MAPSCO. You yeah. went and found page 287, Y-E, and wrote. And you wrote eight. down directions. I remember yeah. I had people telling me directions, and I'd write it down on a little piece of paper. And, you know, that was, yeah, I don't have to do that anymore. I, ha I, I have a thing that tells me what to do. I don't even have to look at it. You know? Yeah, and it's like it was kind of a hassle to try to look up directions every single time. So you try, you really tried to remember when you went to someone's house, yeah. you tried to remember and keep that in your Exactly head. how you got there. Yeah, because yeah. it was a hassle to try to go look that up again. So, I mean, if that's even just a small taste of what life was like back then, man, I can't imagine what their memories were like. I know that I know that there's uh, some missionaries that talk about certain closed countries that they are not allowed to have scripture. And so you'll have people that it's like you almost their identity is this person is Mark 1 through 12. Wow. And that yeah. that's who they are. And having these people in their community are very important because that's what they remember. You, There's no I mean, any any. American kid would say that's impossible. Well, you know, it's really interesting too is that I we have our girls in the school that does a lot of we call it memory work and they, they memorize a lot of stuff. And I am amazed at how well they were they can memorize. And so if you think that you have been taught at a young age that this was it for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. just think how developed that skill would become yeah. as you became an adult and you be, and you learn. And and I, I think there was all I think I, I've heard that the Gospels were written in such a way that has structure, a certain type of structure that helps things like they call it the, the chiasms and mm -hmm. the parallelisms and stuff to help people be able to memorize things. Do you want to unpack that a little bit? The, it's like, I think it's chiasm. Chiasm, chi yeah, yeah, chiasm. Yeah, a chiasm is where you have you introduce something, you say, I'm going to talk about, well, is, that, is this where you say, I'm going to talk about A and B, and then the audience will immediately know, well, then he's going to start talking about B and then go into A. I don't know if that if that's a chiasm or a chiasm is a, well, we have to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> I should remember. I know, I know. But I don't have to remember because I can look it up here. Yeah. See, that's probably the problem. Uh -huh. A chiastic pattern is a literary technique and narrative motifs would be two ideas together, A and B, and then together with variants A prime, B prime, being presented as A, B, B prime, A prime. So, I, I kind of got it. <laughs> it's C-H-I-A-S-T-I-C -I -I -C is, is the, how you spell it if you wanted to look it up. Um, it, but it's, they call it a mnemonic device, and it's just something that helps you remember 
Um, it's used in the Hebrew Bible. It's also used in the New Testament, and it's just a way that people were able to remember what was being said. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, they have just certain literary techniques. I think one of the ones Justin talked was about long, short, long, short, and some of the mm -hmm. creedal poems that you find oh, yeah, in First yeah. Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they just have lots of little techniques to remember stuff. But I think if we're trying to get this across to our uh, to our kids, they can probably all relate to the idea of a teacher that requires them to memorize certain things for a test versus, versus a teacher that allows them to have a little note card. Yeah. And you can ask them, which one do you think that you'll remember more, the one that required you to memorize it or the one that allowed you to have a note card? And they're all going to be like, well, of course, the one that required me to memorize it saying, okay, so if your whole culture was based on that, do you think they're going to have better memories than we do now or worse memories? Well, of course, they're going to have better memories. And so this is kind of walking your kids through the process of reasoning through mm -hmm. some of these arguments. And I mean, it's, it's really sad that probably a third grader could understand this. <laughs> and this is being presented by one of the world's most foremost authorities on the subject. It's like, really? Really, well, this should be embarrassing that you're using this as a line of the, the whole The whole thing, he brought it quite a few times, the whole, well, I don't remember President Obama's speech, and I'm thinking, okay, anybody sitting in here that's just not absorbing everything you say, and they do exactly what you said at the beginning of your talk and question and question, well, well, if they apply that to you, they could pretty quickly see through that, it, you know, that you're comparing apples and oranges here. Yeah, oh, absolutely, apples yeah. and oranges. Yeah, that's why it's like... I, it's like my opinion of him kind of went from, okay, he's doing, he seems pretty, pretty fair and balanced. And then it just kind of kept going down and down and down as like he just kept, atheist. Yeah, the village <laughs> atheist. as he just kept saying stuff that I'm like, really, really, you're going to, I mean, some of the stuff didn't even have evidence. It's just like, well, this is what happened. Okay. According so, to who? <laughs> yeah, exactly. According to who? So it's uh, one of the things when I used to teach science that I used to always tell them, you don't have to know all the answers. You need to know where to find the answers. Yeah. That wasn't the case back then. No, you need to know all the answers Yeah. Uh, back then. It, but also now, for teaching our kids how to think through these things, you don't have to know all the answers, but knowing how to ask the right questions. Yes, teaching your children how to think critically yeah. is a gift that you can give them. And also, if they come to you with a question and you don't immediately know the answer, say, well, let's look for the answer. And that also is modeling to them this concept that you're not going to let your faith be rocked by, you know, little questions. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, maybe we've just grown up with this idea that faith means you can't have any doubt whatsoever. And, and if you have any doubt, then you throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think I used to have that kind of idea about faith. And, and that's I, maybe why your faith was rocked for quite a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I struggled with doubt. It was absolutely unnecessary. Well, yeah. and also because I was not taught any of these things. And these were very, these were the very issues I had to work through. Yeah. The, the, this is something that could, like you said, a third grader could understand. Yeah. You know? And I, I remember growing up hearing my pastor say over and over and over again, I think this was extremely liberating. He would say, never take my word for it. Go find it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. look for yourself. And if I'm wrong, come back and tell me. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and I thought that was an extremely healthy way to be brought up. Because uh, in some of the research that I'm doing, which this is complete tangent, which I'll try not to go too far, on this of looking at why youth are leaving the church, one of the mm -hmm. things that they've talked about is that church is in a place where they can express doubts and they can't interact yeah. with the information. It's, we give it to you, you believe it or not, deal with it. Right. And they're looking at science and, you know, all these other things that are saying, no, go ahead, come on in and question us. If we're not teaching them how to ask the right questions, they're going to be asking questions like Bart Ehrman does where you're asking a question that nothing can answer. Yeah. And that's the wrong kind of question yeah. to be asking. And well, and or you're not following your questions to their logical conclusions. Like some people were forcing Bart to do where it shows that he was – skeptical of all historical documents, yeah, it's, right? It's, Wait a minute, you're a historian and you question all history. I mean, so it's, yeah, you have to say, okay, is this a good question? And what's the logical conclusion of my question? You yeah. know, or this, even where's just, it leaving? Yeah. What's the line of reasoning that this is going down? And mm -hmm. that's where you can train your children to think well, um, how to question, how to think and not what to think because that right there it's I mean the human heart wants to rebel and they're just gonna look for excuses yeah and the one thing 
I went when I was reading the book by Dr. Bach on Bart Ehrman's work, The um, Culture of Doubt. I was drawn to the title because of the idea of a culture of doubt. Here I was in the midst of it. And one thing I was suspecting was that some of my doubt, I needed to doubt my doubt. Yes. You know, I needed to question my questions, you know, and say, why why is this not enough? Why do I need more? Why am I being so stringent here? Why am I being so... Um, why would I expect there to be more, so much, you know, stricter regulations for these historical documents than those? Yeah. Yeah. Why am I being so hyper... Is my skepticism a healthy skepticism? Has it gone too far? And I think with Bart Ehrman, it has gone too far. And he's left it completely unchecked. He is not... And, and he doesn't seem to really care. No. Which makes you wonder... What else is going on? And I hate to say that about people because, you know, who knows? Everybody, We're all such complex things. But you just have to wonder, you know, was there some kind of... Well, he does mention in other places that the problem of evil is something that really he yeah. struggled with. So, And even though I think uh, for our, all the listeners, if anyone here has watched the uh, God's Not Dead, there it's like the, the actual apologetics in that movie I think is good. Some of the caricatures, characters, yeah, yeah. caricatures I was just kind of doing a face palm on. But the one scene in there that I think is accurate in a sense, but when he's like pressing that professor till the you know professor finally admits you know he hates God because his, because God took his mom, a lot of times you won't get to that point with people, but that is what's going on. Yeah. So it's like they they made it to where the person actually admitted it in a way that you kind of wish mm -hmm. people would admit it. Yeah, it's like, it, it reminds me of Job's wife, curse God and die. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of their their approach. They, they've come up with a lot of other sophisticated things. I, I, I see the problem of evil is in so, it, it, it's, it's the core of all these other beliefs that these skeptics have. Yeah, really all is. these other doubts. Absolutely. So I think uh, in summary, so can we rely on eyewitness testimony? I think we've looked at, said, even though there is some research saying that uh, flashbulb memories are incorrect. Take a look at that research because about half of it is saying that they are. Let's see if they've looked at how, what, what are some of the things that make certain people more prone to be correct than others. Mm -hmm. And one, the, the one research we looked at said that people that were more heavily invested uh, in a certain situation we're more likely to remember it accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked at the difference between our culture versus an oral culture and mm -hmm. how much more likely they were to remember and pass things on, you know, transmission faithfully uh, when they didn't have Wikipedia that they could go to. <laughs> yeah. In, in between there, we looked at a culture of reinforcing, it was a, what do we call it? The, uh, um, the community. Community, yeah. yeah. Uh, the memory. A, a, a communal memory. Communal memory. Yeah. yeah. And so Corporate memory. Corporate memory. There you go. Uh, just reinforcing that with each other. And I think based on those evidences right there, I think we have good reason to believe that this was transmitted faithfully from, from eyewitness, witnesses. Oh, and the fact that we even do have those slight discrepancies. Uh -huh. um, that are exactly where you would expect them to be if this was an actual eyewitness. In the peripheral details. Yeah, in yes. the peripheral details. That's exactly where the we would expect. The core of the story is the same, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, all these things tell me, you know what, we've got the story the way that they experienced it. It's authentic. It's authentic. Mm -hmm. So, you want to finish this in prayer? Sure, absolutely. Father God, we just thank you for your wisdom, and thank you for these men like Dr. Bach and Dr. Wallace and uh, Dr. Bass that are working in this area and that are just answering some of the questions that people like skeptics like Bart Ehrman bring up. Thank you for their work, Lord, and, and we just pray for strength for them as they continue to do their writing and researching. And Lord, just I pray that everyone um, can take away from this today that we can trust the eyewitness accounts that you allow to be recorded um, that would eventually make it to us 2,000 years later and give us wisdom in knowing how to approach our children. Every child is unique and so and, and nobody knows their child more than their parent. So please just strengthen these parents to feel confident that they can trust the scriptures and to be able to teach their children um, these things that we talked about today to prepare them for the skeptic, skeptical attacks that, that are surely going to come in some form or another. If not in college, it's on the History Channel. Yeah. So, Lord, just I pray that you strengthen them, strengthen Hillary and I too in this. We thank you for all the things that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
This has been a Mama Bear Apologetics recording. To learn more about Mama Bear Apologetics, please visit us on the web at www.mamabearapologetics.com. Have you been stumped by your kids already? Or maybe you have a nagging question of your own that you think would make a good podcast. Send us an email to askthemamabears at gmail.com and we will do our best. Rise up, ladies. Rise up, Mama Bears. We are all in this together.